you never know when a wave something is going to hit you. So you just have to be patient. And maybe up here for a long time. <laughs> Did you say that's not new? Would you stand for just a brief prayer together if you could? Lord God, I pray that you would hide me in your shadow. That you would be the focus of this time. That you would place me within your shadow so that what we see and what we hear would be less of me and much more of you. I pray for your strength in your hope. And I pray that you would whisper to each person here whatever word of encouragement or challenge you know we need. Bless our time together. And in the end, may we first and foremost honor you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. This series that we're beginning is just uh, a few weeks long. It's called Stories of Hope and Strength. I decided to do this uh, series really quite some time ago uh, because I'm convinced that there's a lot, there are many stories in the Bible that if we would just take the time to read them and prayerfully just reflect on them, we don't need to be deep theological thinkers we don't need to know everything there is about the situation in that story for it to move us or challenge us or encourage us or bring us strength and hope. And so I'm just going to share with you out of Scripture a few stories that some of which we may know well and some of which may be pretty new to you. And I want to begin with the idea that Stories, all stories, not just biblical stories, um, have a variety of purposes. There are some stories that you read or that you hear told that just inform us. Historical stories about people that have preceded us to give us information about their lives. Stories can also instruct us those stories that have a little bit of a meaning behind them on how we can live and how we can grow. Sometimes we call them fables. And there are also stories that just may not teach us a lot, but they just inspire us. Again, stories of lives of people that maybe have preceded us. And yet they've overcome very difficult circumstances and they just inspire us to do better than we think we really can. A really good story does all three, perhaps. Informs, inspires, instructs. And we are often called upon to share stories. I come from a family, and my wife comes from a family in which we just like tell a lot of stories. And the stories that my family tells will often even be true. Not always. <laughs> we tend to elaborate and uh, build upon circumstances that we went through in life. I've noticed that each time I tell a story about my days in school, I get smarter. <laughs> my teachers love me more and my grades go up at least one degree. <laughs> I was reading on Twitter this past week, I got some tweet from, uh, I think it's called Mental Floss. If you don't know Mental Floss, they just have all kinds of crazy ideas and thoughts, just really a very interesting group. And they sent out this tweet and it contained um, questions that universities ask uh, uh, prospective students. So here's your application, you know, name and date and credit card numbers from everybody you know, right? 
And then one of the things, they, they ask questions just to kind of get you thinking and see how you tell a story or you inspire. Here's a couple of the questions. These are honest to goodness questions that some universities asked on their applications. The University of Chicago put this on one of their applications. Where is Waldo really? <laughs> Villanova, what sets your heart on fire? Wake Forest, what outrages you? The University of Pennsylvania, which this is my favorite one, the last one, University of Pennsylvania said, you have just completed a 300-page autobiography. Tell us what is on page 217. Talk about creating a story and learning a little bit of your life. Now, normally, I want you to know that we try to prepare, we try to prepare and plan these services ahead of time. And uh, in the last couple weeks or so, just because of my life situation, haven't been quite as uh, diligent in planning and strategizing. You know, what music is going to go where, and how loud should the bass player be, and you know, and just all of this. All of this stuff. We try to put things in an order that can move you and inspire you. Well, we didn't do that this week. And I will just consider it God's grace that one of the songs you sang was about living in a desert place. And how God's strength and power can be in uh, the desert place that feels very... Very dead. Because the story I'm going to share with you is literally about a desert place. And we did not collaborate on that. It's a story out of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 37, to be precise. Ezekiel was a prophet and a priest from the Old Testament days of the nation of Israel. And the, there's a lot of background I could give you to like Ezekiel's story, but let me just share with you just really very briefly a couple, briefly a couple of things. Ezekiel was preaching in, teaching in, prophesying in a time of absolute international upheaval in this neck of the woods of the world. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, and the Egyptians were all seeking dominance in this part of the world. This should sound a little bit familiar to you. One was crushing the other. One was trying to dominate the other. And all of them pretty much were just whipping up on Israel when they wanted to. As a matter of fact, during Ezekiel's time, um, the Babylonians, which was kind of a big deal kingdom back in those days, the Babylonians actually captured the nation of Israel and took away all of their healthy and strong people. They left behind people who wouldn't do them any good in captivity. Why would you take along people that you just got to feed, but they can't contribute to the cause? So literally the nation... Of God's people, you gotta listen very carefully to this, were dry and dusty and broken and beat up, and they felt simply done. And the people that were captured and taken into Babylonia basically were slaves. So they would feel pretty dry and dusty and done, and they would have probably one question on their lips most of the time. Where in the heck are you, God? Said in Hebrew, but that would be their question. Where are you at this time that we feel dry and broken and useless and this close to being dead? 
And into this situation of life, Ezekiel steps. God calls him to teach and to love and to encourage and to raise people up to listen to God. And there's this great story, Ezekiel 37, that's what I'm going to read to you, just talk about for a few minutes. This great story of Ezekiel about a dry, desert, broken place into which God takes Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37, I'm going to read to you a few verses at a time and then just share you with you what's going on in this situation, all right? Ezekiel 37. The hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and he set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, O sovereign Lord, you alone know. If you know Scripture uh, a little bit, the beginning of that story might ring a bell for you. It is exactly the same thing that God did to Jesus in Luke chapter 4. In Luke chapter 4, it says, after Jesus is baptized, the Spirit of the Lord took Jesus and led him into the desert, a dry place, to be tempted by the devil. Sometimes, I think it is suggesting, sometimes God actually needs to take us into a place in which we recognize that we're not in charge. Maybe said a different way, God sometimes forces us to see reality. Painful and dry though it may be. You see, because the bottom line is you can't resuscitate what you refuse to believe needs resuscitation. If you think that your life is going along fine and you don't need God, then God can't make His way into your life to raise up the dry and broken places. And so God brings Ezekiel into this, this valley and there's bones all the way to the horizon. And I love how Ezekiel tells the story. It says, God just led me all around this place to see just the dry and dusty and brittle bones. He says the bones were very dry. So what does that mean? It's likely it's been dead for a long time. And I do love the beginning of the story. Ezekiel, do you think these bones can live? <laughs> I like Ezekiel's response. Oi, I don't know, only you know, God. I'm sure he threw an oil in there. <laughs> I don't know. God and I have that conversation all the time. You think this can, can turn it? You think I can do this, Rick? Do you think I'm strong enough to deal with this situation? Uh, yeah, I think so. But only you know. That's a pretty weak statement of faith, isn't it? One author puts it this way, Ezekiel, as far as his eye can see, stands in the middle of the desert. Dry bones cover the ground surrounding him, touch the horizon. What is this place? What is this bone-covered valley? He must have asked himself. A voice from heaven rings out, Son, do you think I can do anything with this? I don't know. Only you know that. At the time God gave Ezekiel this vision, you've got to remember the context. At the time God gave Ezekiel this vision, the land, the people of Israel were dry and spiritually stagnant. They had been taken away. Inside they were dry. Externally they were dry. They were turning away from God. And they were saying, surely even God can't deal with this situation. Or he would have already. We're the chosen people. If we're the chosen people, surely God's going to deal with this. 
Crickets. The question God is asking. Is there any hope, Ezekiel? Do you see any hope in this situation? Or do you just see dry bones? Dang it, that's a good question. In the situation you are facing, in the situation I am facing, do we see hope and potential or do we see essentially uh, it just kind of is what it is? Do you believe that God can enter into even your situation and raise you out of whatever dryness you may feel? Or do you and I respond like Ezekiel responds? I, I guess. I don't know. You know. Ezekiel, the leader, is being challenged by God to see the situation and the potential. And Ezekiel's best response is, I, I, don't, I suppose... I'm really grateful that God doesn't leave us in those kind of responses because I'd be dead in the water a long time. Would you? What do you think? Is there any hope for an apathetic and spiritually dry people? Do you believe that change can really occur in a human life? deep down at the spiritual level and that we can grow and make a difference? Do you believe that what looks like dry and dusty and broken bones can get off life support and God can raise it up in ways that just would surprise and indeed shock us? Because it would be shocking, wouldn't it, to see a valley of bones come to life? Wouldn't that be a little freaky? Son of man, can there be life where there is no life? Can you change and become everything God dreams for you to be? Can New Song become everything God dreams? Uh, I suppose. You know God. But the story continues, as you may know. Then the Lord said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath into you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was some noise, a rattling sound. And bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them, then they came to life, they stood up on their feet, a vast army. Ezekiel hears what God is asking them to do, and then he does it. We could just stop right there. Ezekiel hears what God is nudging him to do, telling him to do, encouraging him to do, and he carries it out. 
after speaking these words, God begins to ravel the bones and bring them together. The dry bones stood up on their end. They formed people, tendons over bones, muscle, skin. Before long, a vast army of flesh-covered humans stood before Ezekiel where there was once a dry and desert land. What once was dead is now alive. What once was blind, bones can't see anything, can now see. And Ezekiel sees this all unfold before him. This valley, which was probably a little bit of a frightening kind of place, now becomes a place of life. This group of people that were done and dead now becomes a vast army. And symbolically, God has answered the question, do you think these things can live? I don't know if they can live. You know God. And God says, yeah, I do know. And now let me show you. This is not about sitting on the sidelines and asking God to do what only God can do. This is about listening to the play on the sidelines and then taking it into the game. A vast army now stands where there was once spiritual death and dryness. And the story continues. And God explains what is going on. Because sometimes we don't understand. And just like Jesus sometimes explained the parables. Do you remember there were a number of situations where the disciples, the followers of Jesus, after he told a parable, would come to him and say, that was a really inspiring story. And that was good. What does it mean? And Jesus would say, Boy, <laughs> let me tell you. And God does the same thing here. Let me tell you. Ezekiel, you didn't just see bones come to life. I'm not a magician. There's a reason for this. There's a reason that God wants to see and wants us to see life out of dryness. New hope out of what appears barely breathing. And so it continues on. Verse 11. Then the Lord said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, the people say, our bones are dried up. Our hope is, good on, is, is gone and we are cut off. Therefore, Ezekiel prophesied to them, say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, oh my people, I'm going to open up your graves, bring you up out of them. I'm going to bring you up out of your current situations that feels like you are entombed that feels like you are restricted, that feels like you are held back because this is the way I've always done it, so this is the way I'm always going to do it, and I'll probably always get the same results, but I won't take a risk. And God's saying, no, tell the people, I'm going to bring them up out of what feels like an entombment. I'm going to open up their graves. I'm going to bring them back. I'm going to bring them back to the land of Israel, then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open up your graves and bring you up from them. And here's the verse. If you underline or write notes, get this. I will put my spirit in you. And you will live. I will put my spirit in you and you will live. I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken. I've done it. 
declares the Lord. I will bring you up out of a situation that feels dry. A valley of bones would look pretty dry, it would be pretty dry, and it would look pretty hopeless. There are times in our lives when it feels pretty dry, when it feels pretty hopeless, when we're not sure we can even put our bones together, much less our muscles. And God is saying, I don't want to leave you there. God is asking us not to just listen but to hear. People will often say to me that their lives, their spiritual lives feel dry or they don't feel like they're growing and I will simply respond, how much time do you spend in Scripture and in prayer? You cannot develop an intimate relation with somebody if you ain't spending time with them. You cannot develop an intimacy of non-dryness. If you just throw up a prayer to God periodically as you're driving to and from work. Well, I sort of read the Bible. I, I kind of sort of pray, people would say. Well, then you are going to sort of have a relationship with God. And you are sort of going to be dri driven to this relationship with God. Kind of. But if you want to come up out of a valley of dry bones... You will seek God's breath in your life. You cannot be passionate about a relationship if you don't spend time with that person. God simply spoke words of life through Ezekiel and they became a vast army. God spoke His words and they became a vast army. But they needed to listen. God may be telling us, as we look out of the valley of the dryness of a part of our life, that He doesn't leave us in the valley. He doesn't forsake us in the dryness that He seeks to breathe life back into our spirit. Now I'm just going to share with you three things that I think this story says. And they're rather brief. What I would like you to do is I'd like you to either memorize these or write these down, these brief takeaways from this story. And I'd like you to reflect on them this week. And if so inclined, I would be glad to hear from you. And if so inclined, you could even talk to each other about them. <laughs> and even if more deeply inclined, if any of these takeaways resonate with you and you know somebody else needs it, you might even pray for or with them. Go figure that out. Because if bone and bone can come together and form a vast army through God's Spirit, so can we. I think this story gives us three things. Number one, I think this story gives us hope. And I think it gives us hope because God does not leave us in our dry and lifeless times. There are times when God is looking at our lives and saying, wow, that's some dry bones right there. There are times when we look at our own lives spiritually and if we're honest, we would say, wow, there's some dryness in my life. But this story leads me to believe that, number one, it is hopeful. It is hopeful because God does not leave us in our dry and lifeless lives. 
valley of littered and pointless potential. The bones had potential, but until God spoke into them, they were nothing but potential. He saw a community of God's people in these bones. Ezekiel saw it as dry bones. God saw a vast army that could make a difference in the kingdom, make a difference for the kingdom and in the community. Ezekiel said, well, I suppose... They were dry, they were tired, and they were disconnected. And I think there is tremendous hope that God doesn't leave us there. Number two, I think God actually lays out a strategy here. A strategy for turning life, turning church, turning situations around. Begin with the basics. The strategy is just begin with the basics. Build the framework. That's the bones. That's the structure. We always begin with the basics when we invite God in to turn the situation around. It can be any area of life, in relationships or financial recovery, spiritual depth and growth, whatever it is. You cannot start algebra until you get addition and subtraction right. You can dive into the calculus book all you want. But you better know how to do something prior to that. Or you talk about dry and dust. The same way in this story, God lays out some strategy. Let's bring the structure together. Let's put some muscle into it. Let's get connected. I'm not making this up. This is here. It is hopeful that God does not leave us in dry and lifeless times. It is a strategy that God is saying, begin with the framework. Whatever in your life feels disconnected, start connecting it. The bones, the structure may have life and potential, but the bones can't do anything if they are disconnected. Connections take place through small groups through ministry, through serving, through prayer, through sharing of spiritual burdens. If you are a Christian island unto yourself, you are not doing yourself any good. This Christianity that says I can make my way through my mess on my own, I don't need to share it with anybody, I can pull myself up by my own bootstraps, I got news for you, that ain't biblical Christianity. And so I think this story from Ezekiel is saying, one, it's very hopeful. God doesn't leave us in dry and dusty places. Two, there is a strategy. Build together the framework. Lean into one another. Connect with one another. And third, frankly, I think it's nothing but a reminder. It's a reminder that it is God's Spirit and only God's Spirit that will be the catalyst for a vibrant, and powerful life. It is a reminder. If you read through the story, remember the bones came together. The tendons were all there. The muscles were all there. And they just stood there mute. They had no breath. The word breath in the Hebrew Bible is also spirit. They didn't have God's spirit. God's spirit. Listen to this. I wrote this down. I think it's important. God's Spirit does not do our part. God's Spirit gives life to our part. God's Spirit doesn't do the things that we are supposed to do. Connect. Stand. Be courageous, reach out, make a difference. But God's Spirit is the catalyst and the strength behind that. So that's it. 
I think is a very powerful story. I know for me in my life and where I am right now, it's a very important reminder. And I know most of you well enough to know that it should be reminding you of some things too. One, it's very hopeful that God doesn't leave us in dry valleys. Even when He takes us there to show us what is. Two, it's a strategy. The Christian faith is not clicking your heels together and hoping you get back to Kansas. The Christian faith is bringing together step by step, one by one, bones and muscle and tendon and people. And it's a reminder that God will do His part. But we are called to do ours. It's hope. It's strategy. It's a reminder of what can be in a dry and dusty time. It's hope. It's strategy. It's a reminder that no matter what is going on in your life or through your life or in this church or through this church, God is always about raising and resurrecting and empowering. Even when as you look around, it feels pretty dry. It feels pretty valley and bone-like. And it feels like sometimes you and I would respond like Ezekiel responded. Hey, do you think, do you think this thing could live? Do you think this thing could become a vast army? And we respond like Ezekiel. I think. God's asking us to receive the breath, which will bring life. When there's a valley and it's dry, Jesus summed up most of this story as he frequently does. Very briefly. Jesus' words about for, Jesus words for us when we feel weary and not able. When we just feel not able. Or when we look around and we see, I don't know, God. I guess you can do it, but I don't know. Jesus said this. Come to me. All of you who are weary, burdened, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I'm gentle, humble, and you'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. But nowhere in there does he say, and I'll leave you to your dryness. And nowhere in there does he say, well, you're a little too old to really help this thing. Or you're not smart enough, or you're not mature enough in your faith, or you haven't been kind of attending this thing long enough. Maybe this story of Ezekiel is saying to everybody in this room, do you think that God can raise up a vast army out of what you see before you? Even what you see before you in the mirror, do you think God can raise up a vast army 
out of what you see before you. Maybe, maybe God's asking us just to respond. You can. I'll do my part. Maybe that's all he wants. You can. I'll do my part. To me, it's very hopeful that God may show us the dryness, but he takes us to life. God shows us what is. He's not an illusionist. But then he takes us to life to make a kingdom difference. So, son of man, daughter of man, do you think God can make this live? Do you think? You have to answer that. Will you stand together for your prayer? God, thank you for the willingness of Ezekiel to be led by you into a place that was dead and decaying and dry. Thank you for the example of Ezekiel being willing to speak words of life into situations that appear hopeless. But most of all, thank you for your spirit which continues to speak to us, encourage us, challenge us. Help us as a church to be everything you dream us to be. Help us as people to be envisioned by your vision, empowered by your power, strengthened and given hope for the days ahead. All this we ask in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.